I mix what I like, what I like, what I like. Thank you, everybody. Um, and it's always funny to hear when, when your friends write bio points for you. Uh, Dr. Ali Johnson is a, is a good friend and a, a brilliant scholar in Brazilian history, too. Um, so it's nice to, you know. Uh, anyway, thank you all for coming. And, and, and uh, I, I want to first say that it's a complete honor to be here again. Um, and I, I will admit publicly that it comes at a, uh, selfishly, it comes at a nice time because, as was somewhat alluded to, uh, you know, going through our own personal struggles individually with our institutions and all that, it's always nice to be somewhat, in, you know, welcomed and invited. And if I can paraphrase my godfather, uh, uh, movement veteran and all that, he always says, um, I'm never surprised when I'm asked to leave, I'm only surprised by how long I'm allowed to stay. Um, and that I find to be my experience as well. Um, I want to start off by just saying a quick word about I mix what I like. It's not meant to be an individual moniker at all. It's meant to be an homage to Steve Biko and I write what I like. Uh, and when we started uh, working with uh, the concept of the philosophy of emancipatory journalism, uh, which I always like to share, I found uh, in a communication theory journal stacked slated for the trash while I was uh, consigned or, or exiled in the PhD program at the University of Maryland. Um, again, for, you know, as a friend of mine once said, you're, uh, you're politically out of the closet, and uh, that often causes tension. So I was sitting there in this exiled office, and I see these stack of journals. There was this, this the, uh, 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 edition that featured an article about what was called emancipatory journalism, written by Dr. Hemant Shaw. And I said, just the title alone, emancipatory journalism, I was like, that. And basically, essentially, what it was is what a, a lot of us have been engaged in, the idea that colonized people must produce their own journalism as part of their own political project. Uh, it's not about um, uh, you know, critiquing mainstream media or in, in trying even to engage mainstream media. It's about producing one's own or the movement's own uh, to expand uh, the reach of your own work and to recruit people to, to work with you. Uh, and so it's perfect that we're here to commemorate uh, the work of Emory Douglas and, and Catherine Cleaver and the Black Panther Party because in part one of their many projects was to perform this you know, emancipatory journalistic ethic. Um, so I just wanted to quickly point that out. In, in the book, I mix what I like, a mixtape manifesto, which you can get for free at the website. Um, uh, all the proceeds have traditionally just gone to political prisoners anyway. Um, uh, it basically was arguing, it's, it's a few years old now, it was basically arguing that the mixtape has a particular history and relationship to hip-hop that exposes colonial relationships uh, and the environment, the, the media apparatus that, that we're struggling against, and it was arguing, again, that the mixtape be turned into an emancipatory project um, and was sort of uh, a precursor to what I would like to talk some about today, the, the politics of propaganda, uh, popular culture, media, um, and a critique in particular of the internet and social media, which is what that mixtape project was all about, the idea that the, the internet is not going to solve any problems, and maybe we can come back to that in just a minute. Um, so I had initially titled this talk, Defining Phenomena, uh, Propaganda Power in the Black Panther Party, after the definition of power I understood to come from Dr. Huey P. Newton, that power is the ability to define phenomena and have it act in a desired manner. But after some conversation the other night with Kathleen Cleaver, uh, I thought maybe I should you know, title the project as something like an attempt at, at an homage to positive mythology. Um, so I just want to make, I'm going to, I want to quickly summarize a couple points I'm, I'm going to intend to make and then th probably ramble a little bit and then hopefully it'll be fleshed out in Q&A in our discussion uh, afterwards. But uh, simply, uh, propaganda, public relations, and psychological warfare are synonyms. Uh, and the primary means by which the elite communicate with us. Um, oh, so this is, this is actually, I, I just threw a couple of images together. This is not in any way meant to, some, some of the beautiful presentations earlier, I just was like sitting back there thinking, man, I need to throw a few images together. And, and it's, so it's not done very well, very quickly. But this is a picture um, that's actually my daughter's hand uh, looking over one of the Black Panther newspapers that we had as we were making a, a video mixtape uh, commemorating George Jackson, uh, which I encourage people to please look at at our website. It's for free. It's, it's a, a video mixtape, music, 
interviews. Uh, Bashi Rose, my colleague, did a beautiful job editing it. Um, and it also caused some trouble because <laughs> it was not a welcomed project uh, in a supposedly anomaly alternative uh, left press that we were working with at the time. But um, anyway, uh, from this documentary, Psy War, I borrow this, 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 this comment, this line, that propaganda is the primary means by which the elite communicate with the rest of us. Um, and concerns over uh, uh, these have, have and continue to be the impetus for the study of media and communication in the United States. That is, the very field that, of which I'm, I'm uh, professionally trained, so to speak, was developed as a colonial imperial project. I mean, the history of communication studies in the United States is specifically about how do you create American citizens out of Europeans, how do you redefine uh, uh, so-called world majority people or so-called minorities, uh, how do you put people into place? And then ultimately, how do you get young men to go to war? That was uh, you know, a primary uh, impetus of the, of the project. Um, so this idea that communication studies is supposed to reveal and enlighten and emancipate is, I think, a misnomer, much like any of the other fields that within, within most of us in the academic world work. Um, and as Fanon pointed out, uh, media are meant to be a supplement to the physical conquering of land. So there's the military takeover, and then right after that is the, the psychological component, the, the symbolic component of managing pub basically managing public opinion and keeping people locked in the colonial state. And then, of course, as he points out and others, the colonial relationship is important because it's not that, it's not just, as, and as uh, Walter uh, Lippmann wrote in his famous 1920 book on uh, public opinion, he very explicitly wrote, that white people have to create a negative image of black people for their own self-concept and self-defense. He called it a self-defense mechanism, in fact. So a hundred years later, as we look at the, the proliferation of negative and anti-black uh, imagery throughout popular media, uh, it's, it should be understood not just as an assault on African descendants, but it should be seen as a project of propping up the psyche of, of the imperialist, of, of, the, of the colonizer. Um, and then similarly, uh, media and social media and communication technology uh, put to that purpose don't alter social relationships at all. They intensify them. Uh, so uh, I, I think here of the classic book by Harold Ennis, The Bias of Communication, where he basically looks at the history of the world through communication technology and I think rightly argues that as the communication technology increases, so d does the ability for those in power to control and, and uh, influence those uh, in their purview, and in fact, that was the purpose. And you know, many of us are Christians or believe in Christianity because the uh, Gutenberg Bible was the f one of the first mass-produced books in the world, um, and it's that's it. Um, and then, in fact, if we speed up to today and we look at the work of, of sisters like Morgan Maxwell and Sophia Moja Noble, uh, we learn that black engagement with social media creates physical and psychological trauma while also benefiting financially and in terms of surveillance, media companies and intelligence agencies. So not only is social media and the, the pervasiveness of, of, of new technology not improving anything, it's in fact, I think, working against us. Uh, there was some discussion already today about the, the um, uh, being hesitant in wanting to redistribute negative imagery or the suffering of, of uh, uh, African people, black people around the world, um, and in part some of these studies actually demonstrate and prove that there is literal physical and, and psychological trauma that results. Uh, and then of course intelligence agencies which are themselves wrapped up in, in Google and Apple and AT&T and all this other, and, uh, um, uh, you know, Bezos and Amazon share CIA database. I mean, all these things are connected. So when we Google and when we search and we watch YouTube, we're not only propping up these companies, but we're aiding our own surveillance. Then I also want to just point out very quickly that, uh, uh, also similarly, that entertainment in particular must be understood as well as part of the colonial matrix and is itself a euphemism for soft power and packaged warfare. So a, a lot of the people who disagree with me, and it, it happens uh, in my classes all the time, a lot of people say, well, you're just being too, you're too critical of popular media because it's just entertainment, and I'm saying that's exactly the wrong way to look at it. It's labeled entertainment so that we don't criticize it and we're less likely um, to resist the, the uh, included messages which negatively impact our world. As it relates to our specific topic today, of all the discussion and pop cultural representation of the Black Panther Party. So it's, so it's in this context I'm trying to just quickly situate where I want to go with the Black Panther Party here, that, that, that 
from my own limited point of view, that in all the popular culture and all the discussion of this incredibly important and famous organization, it's the ideas of the party, those with which they worked, that are most suppressed, distorted, and the target of an immaterial assault that, most, that at worst rivals that suffered literally to this day by its members or ideological adherents. So again, like Fanon was saying, there is the physical repression of the people involved, and then there is the, the, the subsequent distortion of the ideas with which they worked. And as I'm arguing here, the Panthers don't, we almost never hear substantive discussion of the ideas. Socialism, communism, pan-Africanism, armed struggle, intercommunalism. We hear more about the personalities, the, the symbolism, the um, internecine beefs, uh, and not enough about the ideas. And I think this is an intentional part of the, com the, the process of, of not being able to omit something that is this popular and this, this powerful, so therefore having to distort it and keep it, you know, um, uh, uh, almost uninterpretable. Uh, Kind of like with Dr. King, I mean, he's a perfect example of it. I think the most known and least understood person in world history, maybe second only to the historical Jesus Christ, this is my joke. But I mean, so much reference to him is, is made and almost nothing of, of, in terms of what he, he actually said, did, or what made him a threat to the state uh, that assassinated him. Anyway, uh, as with the Bar Black Panther Party, and the Black Panther Party itself was clear, uh, it produced the Black Panther Party newspaper, the intercom you know, intercommunal news service, media appearances, writings, and of course, an amazing, in the amazing art honored here, that of Emory Douglas, whose artistic and political heir, by the way, Kevin Rashid Johnson, uh, remains in prison to this day. Um, he's an artist and a political prisoner of my generation who, who I think um, emulates uh, um, in a positive way, the work of Emory Douglas and, and has uh, extended the Panther politics into the prison system and is suffering. I mean, he's been beaten and tortured and just moved, uh, I think, this past week again. Um, Kevin Rashid Johnson, if you don't, please look him up, uh, and all the other political prisoners that are continue to suffer. Um, uh, but he remains imprisoned, and the propaganda and the psychological warfare are essential to any political victory and are deployed today with a sophistication that is staggeringly effective, and I think no more so than in the United States. Um, by the way, understanding the need for this, and this is why I, I thought it was great that we heard about Robert and Mabel Williams, because of course they not only were activists and organizers, uh, but they produced their own media, Radio Free Dixie, they had the, uh, I forgot the name of the, the pamphlet that they produced, and it was interesting because in the Freedom Archives, discussion, and this is actually, a, I, if I can take a quick detour here, this, this is actually relevant because in the Freedom Archives brilliant audio history of Robert and Mabel Williams, you get a story that you don't get in the PBS sponsored version of their story that got more, the public broadcasting system that got more pub, uh, popular coverage in the United States. And when Mabel Williams came on my radio show at the time, she asked me not to say this uh, publicly, and she didn't want to you know, acknowledge this difference publicly, um, I think it's okay to do so now because in the Freedom Archives version you get this wonderful story about how their pamphlet that, that she and Robert worked on made its way to Vietnam. And when they met with the Vietnamese leadership, they were told that it was their pamphlets that advocated for guerrilla warfare and armed struggle that, that inspired or encouraged or helped support Ho Chi Minh's decision to, for the Tet Offensive. And I always think that's important because, to whatever extent it's true, because the idea that no matter how small your reach or, or your, you think your reach is, it, the impact it can have on someone in another part of the world is potentially tremendous. So this is why I think it's, as, even in this social media moment where there's so much attention on how many hits and likes and whatever you get, that I think we need to step back from that and, and maybe work more carefully to produce something substantive and, um, and strong and maybe work better to, to collectivize our efforts to popularize them, but we shouldn't be so much worried about how many people are actually looking at them and be more interested in who is looking at it um, and what they're gonna do with that information. Um, but the PBS version didn't tell that story. The way that these stories get distorted and passed down to us, and as I was trying to say quickly yesterday, why so many of us have to reinvent the wheel almost from scratch because we're not being institutionally taught and we're, not, uh, we're being cut off from so much important information about these histories of struggle. So as I was saying a little bit yesterday, the absence of a specific Black Panther Party today, I think, has less to do with the accuracy of their analysis, which is often part, I think, of, of the critique that people have, or they, they got wiped out because their analysis wasn't perfect or their application of it wasn't perfect. 
But I think it's specifically because of the accuracy of their conclusions that they became the target of the most powerful state in human history. And it's why so much effort continues to this day in redefining what cannot be uh, uh, recommitted to, what cannot be allowed to be recommitted to. And so when we look at the counterintelligence program of the FBI, um, one of the, I think, number six, the, or the fifth tenet specifically targeting the black nationalist so-called hate groups was that they said that the youth, black youth must be disconnected from these histories. And it says something to the effect that all manner of effort must be engaged to make sure that black youth don't see the black radical traditions of that day as viable. So again, my generation comes in uh, born into the post black, black power moment and w so much of what we get are these, again, black images, black representations, symbolic, uh, in seemingly inclusive in terms of sitcoms and television. We saw Roots on TV, we see black journalists get hired and all these things. But the point of that was all to disassociate us uh, from these histories. Which is again why I think Kwame Ture or Stokely Carmichael's point is so important when he said black visibility is not black power. And we lose sight of that, especially today. Um, Uh, fundamental for this remains, I probably should have started with this, is, uh, for me, is, is George Jackson. And I, and I am honored to be able to say that uh, the man, the, the Reverend Earl Neal, that, uh, that unfortunately had to eulogize George, uh, married me and my wife as his last act in the United States before retiring to South Africa. And I was, it was, so personally, I was like, man, get this little connection to George Jackson, who's, to me, the, the ultimate hero. Um, and for me, George's work is so important because not only because as a Black Panther Party member is he, is he, was he brilliant, but he's also, I think, one of the lesser known and lesser discussed figures despite having left us two books, despite having uh, had such an impact on, on our, our political struggles. Um, but in part because he said we need three things that I think are still true even if I'm only willing to work uh, on two of them. Um, because he said we need a secret army I'm not engaged in that. We also need an underground press and a political organization whose goal and purpose is primarily to popularize the concept of revolution, uh, which, is one, my, my, which is what drove my attempt to work with the Green Party at the time. I, I think there's a lot of room for critique there. Uh, but that was the point that I was trying to, to make then, that, that, that much like what the Black Panther Party had done with electoral politics, we need to be producing our own candidates we need to be uh, producing our own standards of politics that those candidates will carry into the arena and not wait for a Wall Street funded set of Democratic Party folks to be handed down to us as an apparent improvement to, um, you know, Agent Orange, as Buster Rhymes called him. Um, <laughs> but this, of course, is the trick, and particularly with black America. If you can define the standard of black America on plantation enslavement, then everything looks like progress. And this has been a trick played against us forever. Uh, well, at least you're not on the plantation. Well, well, damn, that's not my standard. <laughs> I mean, my standard is some fantasy we've never even experienced, and everything else looks worse. So that's why I, I, I really feel the energy in the room when people say we need a revolution now, immediately. Um, but I should also mention that, that it's, it's, it's relevant, that George to me is relevant uh, um, because he, as I said, is not often discussed because of his advocation of uh, the colonial analogy of socialism, of armed struggle, guerrilla warfare, of his critique of the left, of his critique of liberal politics. Uh, and, and as we saw even in the case of Stanley Tukey Williams, the founder of the Crips gang, as it's called, a street organization in Los Angeles, who was put to death by Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, I think in 2005. Uh, Schwarzenegger admitted in a statement that the reason he was not willing to let Tukey off of death row was because, in part, he had written a book that praised George Jackson, which I think is the state admitting just for adherence to the ideas of George Jackson. Tukey wasn't doing any of them. He was writing children's books and getting Nobel Peace Prize nominations and from prison and all this other stuff. But just the positive nominal association with a George Jackson is a death sentence in the United States. So while I cannot speak with much authority about any other country, I'm confident in saying that coming from the United States, it is truly like emerging from Marshall McLuhan's fishbowl, where, as he said, we don't know who discovered water, but we know it was not the fish. And all pervasive environment is always beyond perception. And I think this was the goal uh, created intentionally in the United States 
um, and I'm sure elsewhere, uh, to create, as Charles Mills said, a world that we cannot um, interpret. Uh, and it is largely perception that I want to discuss, uh, that I'm trying to discuss here briefly, because the Black Panther Party developed as a necessity, as a necessity, still a necessity within the United States and within a state apparatus that not likely since the Nazis had previously borrowed much of the Americans' early 20th century studies into the development of political communication, propaganda, or psycho psychological warfare, had the world been confronted by a weaponized media and communications environment, one that has only intensified and been made more sophisticated in the years since. And there really is a tremendously incestuously owned and controlled media environment in the United States. And without right now arguing much about how ownership shapes content, we should note that if we look closely at interlocking boards of directors and private equity investment, we see really that much of what we get is an orchestrated media environment that is not for economic profit, but specifically for the management of public opinion and behavior. And one thing I, we can come back to maybe if, if we have time is that I argue in terms of hip hop and the promotion of a commercial form of hip hop to do, walk us away from radical forms. If we look at the companies that produce it, the, the biggest music company in the world, Universal Music Group, is only 14% of Vivendi. And my point in that is that 14% is not insignificant, but it is not a big enough percentage to argue that Vivendi needs the largest music company in the world for its financial stability. What I think it's doing, and when we look at the others, Warner Music Group is only 1% of Leo Blavatnik's entire holdings, if, and Sony Music is only 6% of Sony's overall operation. What I think they're involving themselves in in popular culture is to limit and manage popular discussion, public opinion, uh, and specifically to target the youth that have been targeted by COINTELPRO to not become more radical. So the rap music that helped radicalize my generation has been completely removed from popularity in the United States. It's still, radical rap music is produced more than ever around the world. It's harder to find than ever. And it's even with all these new technologies, uh, iTunes and Spotify and all these things, all it does is allow those same organizations to uh, a greater deal of ability to promote their version of our cultural production. And this is what I think it speaks to. This is part of what I think it speaks to in terms of what we're dealing with in the Panthers. So the, the picture in the middle was the one time I dared to engage the beehive or bayhive or whatever. And I never get this much Twitter attention. I got punished <laughs> after that Super Bowl appearance. And I was trying to even phrase it. Look, I tried to be nice. This is not a diss. Just trying to raise a question about the function of celebrity. If after the Super Bowl, if she can come out and wiggle with some Afro wigs and, and an X formation and be called a revolutionary, then what is Asada, who actually engaged in those politics, engaged in that struggle, and is exiled with a $2 million death warrant on her head, put in part, raised by the black president and a black, head of the, a black spokesperson for the FBI and a black attorney general? It was Eric Holder and Obama that upped the ante on her. Anyway, to the left, the other two pictures are, are just examples I, I, I wanted to throw out because a lot of the popular symbolic discussion of the Black Panther Party still exists, but exists in the ways that these kinds of films depict them. If anybody saw the butler, when he brings home his Black Panther girlfriend, the Black Panther Party is represented as a disrespectful, hostile, angry woman yelling at Oprah, the grandmother, you know, like, you know, and you're supposed to walk away from that, like, Dad, well, you know, if that's what it was all about, of course we don't want that. And on the right, I, I years, a couple years ago, agreed to co-author a chapter on Tyler Perry, which, which, so I had to watch all his movies, and it's, it's just a complete nightmare. And I, I really do believe that when they reopen the death camps, the trains containing black people will air his movies. Jews will get Seinfeld, and a Woody Allen film, um, everybody will get their tailored. Black people will get Tyler Perry films and we'll be walked off to the death camps watching these movies. Like, oh, it's all good. Tyler Perry's there. And for us, we wake up and be dead, it'd be too late. But this is how it was in this, in, in the movie, in this movie, I don't know if anybody saw it. I hope you didn't. Thank you. But in this, in this movie, they're showing this Medea character going through all of her uh, historic uh, changes. And when they label her going through her criminal stage, they depict her as this. 
So again, it's the panther image that is criminalized symbolically. And my point in all of this is that whether it's done through the Beyonce form or, or any of the other forms, the, the ideas, the symbolism of the Black Panther Party has to be distorted. It can't be carried. Again, it's too popular to omit. You know, you have to talk a little bit about Malcolm. You have to talk a little bit about King. You have to talk a little bit about the Panthers, but you have to do it in a way that distorts the, their very work. And as Lenin once pointed out, it, 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 turns, them, it turns heroes and, and enemies of the state into sycophants of the state. So now we get a King Memorial in D.C. Uh, we get, we get um, um, uh, you know, um, we're told that a $50 million sponsored Pepsi tour is a, is a positive dissemination of the Black Panther symbol. Um, and that, that Beyonce is doing something good. And this is not a diss of her, again, it's not about her. It's, uh, um, it's about the popular symbolism and what the function of that is in our, in our current media environment and context. So of the many contributions made by the Black Panther Party and Emory Douglas artistically, there is a political point that Emory once made uh, which also has for me been a defining feature of my approach to media studies, media making, and critique. That, uh, that what, and he said something to the fact that what gave his work meaning and value was the preceding development of a political organization. And this is something that I've struggled with my artistic comrades a lot around, uh, in part because I'm not a good rapper, I can't draw, I can't, you know, people, the joke used to be, you know, you, you become a journalist to cover what you cannot do. So that was, you know, what I, you know, but when I work with them, and maybe this is the bias I, I lose by not having that talent, but a lot of my artist comrades say, you know, the song I've written is my contribution to the struggle. The painting I drew is my contribution to the struggle. And I would always be like, but damn, man, we need a little bit more. We need, like, we need work. So when I read Emery in an interview saying, like, I joined the party and then found a way for my art to fit that function, and the party's organization gave my work the meaning that it still has, that to me, and he's here, maybe he can correct me if I misinterpreted that, but that's how I've understood how this is supposed to work. Um, and that's that emancipatory journalistic ethic, that you're, you're joining an organization and producing journalism, producing media, producing art as a function of that organizational work. So my own affinity for emancipatory journalism is born of the precise ethic, even if incompletely practiced. Um, so similarly, as, as we, we know from Kathleen Cleaver, as Secretary of Communications, self-appointed, as I think she said last night, which I think is great, has, has uh, long understood the power of self-definition, the ability to define phenomena and then have it act in a desired manner. So if you can define black people as revolutionaries, part of an international con colonial struggle, we will act in that desired manner. If you can convince, as often the case, that black people are inferior and less than, then we will act in that desired manner. At the same time that the Black Panther Party was developing, though, the power structure was itself reorganizing. Empire was developing and making improvements to its own system of making meaning, propaganda, and psychological warfare. As colonized people were redefining themselves and their nations, uh, communication scholars of the 1950s, for instance, like Carl Deutsch, wrote that the United States and the West were developing their own supranational structures meant to render meaningless the petty nationalisms of the colonized. In other words, you want to be free, free, yeah, have a flag, have a border, have a little TV station, have a president. But we're going to create something that's going to render as much of that meaningless as possible. And in the context of today's discussion, uh, where I think Huey Newton was exactly right, that the reason we can't decolonized to a pre-existing nation that never really existed, one reason is because of the communication reach and ability of the colonizer to cross borders with their messages, to, to you know, the number one export of the United States is popular culture. Uh, um, internet, intellectual property is a bigger business than, than agriculture, uh, cars, and, and, and airplane industries in the United States, and controlling of uh, a copyright and who gets credit and who can disseminate what, who can shelve a project, who can green light a project, all of that is tightly controlled. There's not one black person in Hollywood that can green light a film. You star in a film maybe, but you can't say it's gonna get made. 
So they were creating structures to, to, to render these nationalisms meaningless. And I think Newton and others, that's why he was developing this intercommunal uh, theory. I think that was brilliant, needs to be picked up on even further. And it's also in this same time that the Defense Department created what we now call the Internet. And I think we lose sight that the Internet is U.S. military technology. The fact that we get to play with it, as, as the brilliant scholar Bruce Cosby once pointed out, there's a difference between technology and gadgetry. And in my generation, the, the, the great uh, um, rapper J. Rue the Damager pointed out that, that the same chip that powers my Sega powers nuclear arms. And that was the point. Like, we play with Segas and PlayStations, but that technology is controlling satellites and missiles and surveillance and, and all kinds of other things. So we think that because we can tweet and Facebook and blog that we're doing something. And no, no, no. I think quite the opposite. And I think if we just look um, somewhat simply, the largest movements all were developed prior to the Internet. The most radical militant movements all existed prior to the internet. The internet hasn't helped that one bit. I think, in fact, worked against it. I want to talk, re mention uh, very briefly here the work of Francis Stoner Saunders, um, whose book, The CIA and Cultural Cold War, should be uh, uh, compensatory reading for everybody. Because it adds further context, uh, context in that her work details the value of Western world puts on the use of media, art, and pop culture in disseminating a sophisticated, nuanced, and reactionary definition of the state and concepts of policing, military, and rebellion. And to summarize one point that she makes in the book, uh, quote here, it was not a matter, did I have a picture over here? Oh, I'm gonna come back to, oh yeah, I'm gonna come back to that, I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, she says, it was not a matter of buying off and subverting individual writers and scholars, but of setting up an arbitrary and factitious system of values by which academic personnel were advanced, magazine editors appointed, and scholars subsidized and published, not necessarily on their merits, though these were sometimes considerable, but because of their allegiance, end quote. And I thought, when I first read this, I thought, oh, this, is, this is beautiful. I, I, more recently, in their brilliant book, National Security Cinema, Alfred and Secker, referring back to Stoner, Saunders, said that the content of film and television in, in the United States is directly, regularly, and secretly determined by the U.S. government, led by the CIA and Pentagon. More visible since the 1980s is what we identify as a, a distinct genre, national security cinema, namely those films that follow self-serving official histories and exalt in the righteousness of U.S. foreign policy, end quote. Their files have uncovered between 1911 and 2017, 814 films received Defense Department support, 1,133 TV titles uh, um, got Defense Department support, and the number of screen entertainment products supported by the Defense Department, if you add the, the TV and the film, it goes up almost 2,000 films and TV shows uh, carefully manicured by the CIA, Defense Department, and other intelligence agencies. So if we are to include the individual episodes for titles, shows like 24 or Homeland or NCIS. Do you all watch those shows overseas? Are they big over here, Homeland? And <laughs> the Congressman John Lewis, in his memoir, once he wrote, the, it was, oh man, he said that when he was in, in SNCC and he went in 1964 throughout the continent of Africa, he said every African leader they stopped to meet with had previously met with Malcolm X and told him, if you're anywhere to the right of Malcolm X, we don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> Malcolm X had become the political standard for, for, for activism throughout the African continent. And I think about that because, flash forward to our generation, what is the, the, the dominant export of the United States? It's not a Malcolm X. It's popular culture. It's TV. It's film. It's rap music. And when you travel throughout the African continent, as I have uh, to a certain extent, the discussion isn't so much about Malcolm. It's about, you know, when they, felt, when they saw us as, as black Americans, it was Tupac, Big E, 50 Cent. It was, that had become, or some other popular film had become the, the, the uh, standard by which we were engaging one another. And I think, again, that this is not an accident. So the export of government-sponsored, pro-state media, particularly involving policing and military, uh, which Malcolm said the you know, police do locally, what the military do internationally, when, when we see that, what we're seeing is, again, a media apparatus that is meant to devalue concepts of revolution, 
promote the idea that even if there are bad cops, they're just, you know, a bad apple and the institution itself will reorganize and save the day in the end. The military, even when they make mistakes, they're doing a righteous job, doing the best they can, you know, spread freedom and democracy. <laughs> um, So in the late 1990s, Frances Stoner Saunders and her colleague David Eldridge found letters proving that the head of censorship at Paramount Pictures regularly wrote to an anonymous individual at the CIA to tell how he promoted narratives favorable to the agency. And in fact, in that book, they detail that it was a film script that first used the, the term CIA, or Central Intelligence Agency, because before that, they had been the OSS, or the Office of Special Services. And it was a film that said, you know what, we need a Central Intelligence Agency. And from that film developed it's deep. I mean, so, so this idea that, well, the idea that there's, a, that there's a separation, I mean, the idea that there's not a political purpose to film or that it's just entertainment, we need to, as Bob Brown says, shotgun that idea, just blow that out the water. Um, so I've mentioned the above described system because I think it allows us to move beyond discussions of conspiracy, which I think, of course, is, you know, meant to, prevent analysis, um, and focus rather on the function of institutions, and as I want to say a word about quickly, of celebrity itself. And again, as Malcolm X said, because you know, uh, uh, a duck cannot produce a chicken. A duck egg cannot produce a chicken. Um, so the, 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 the product is a designed result of a, of a, of a systemic effort. I, I just added this because uh, the sister that spoke earlier mentioned the, 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 the question of violence. Um, so this is a quick aside, I just had to throw this in. Russell Maroon Schultz, Black Panther Party member, uh, called Maroon because he kept escaping from prison, uh, wrote this book uh, within the last couple of years and in it he talks about what is the real opposite of, of nonviolence is counterviolence, not peace. The absence of something is not its opposite. So when that discussion yesterday about Robert Williams saying, well, my gun is gonna bring peace because they won't shoot me. If they see I, they will themselves get shot, I think is an important point uh, to just quickly make here. Um, sorry that that wasn't put in more. But this is sort of the point I wanted to get to very quickly and uh, part of how academia promotes this process and uh, talk a little bit about the function of celebrity in the last few minutes that I have here. Uh, in my own work through our, through our website, the former radio show that I, that I was doing for some years, um, I engaged as much as I could in some of these debates. Um, I don't know, if, are any of you familiar with Peniel Joseph? Okay, that's good, good. Very popular institutional scholar in the United States who called himself at one point, he's, I think he's my age or younger actually, called himself the, the, the um, the father of black power studies. Uh, and as Bob Brown, co comrade of Kwame Ture, said to him, or said of him, well, if you're the father, then who's the mother? Uh, and how do you get to be, you know, like, who are you? Yeah, anyway. But what Peniel has done in his work, uh, in this book, Stokely, A Life, and in his previous work, um, from Malcolm X to Barack Obama, something like black power, something, something like, what he's done is, is, is redefined black power, redefined that history, and has been promoted as a scholar uh, um, to, to redefine that history. Again, as I'm arguing for su successive generations to not understand what they're dealing with. And I've, I invited him, we had a nice debate, you can get it on our website if you want to hear it, where I argued that he was defining black power as Nixon had done. Where Nixon said, if you want black power, we'll give it to you. You can have a few black politicians, you can have black capitalism, and there you go. Uh, and in his book on Stokely, what Peniel does is very slyly redefine Stokely as, as, as irrelevant and his politics as irrelevant and having him move away from political maturity when he became more critical of uh, the civil rights movement and electoral politics and the mainstream movements as they were occurring in the United States uh, and never gives him an, an ad adequate and honest run about his politics. His mentor, Peniel Josephs that is, Manning Marable, uh, his final produced book that I actually now don't think he actually wrote or saw the final version of, and that's a longer conversation. But, but um, in his final book, or the book attributed to him in his, his last work, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, does much of the same thing with horrible scholarship, poor, 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 poor work, which is, again, 
quite a departure from Maribel's career, even where I might disagree with him politically on a couple of things. He was a sound scholar, so this book is just horribly trash. But it was promoted in New York Times bestseller. It's, 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 it's used all over the place. It's just written up again in New York Times as, 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 as the book you need to. And I bring it up not only because my, my colleague, Dr. Todd Burroughs, and I wrote or edited a, or co-edited a book of responses that, that you see here, but primarily because of an event that happened that I think speaks to, to a lot of what I'm trying to say here that we could not write about because I was told if I did write about it, it would open us up to a lawsuit. But I have no problem sharing it here. Where Zahir Ali, who worked for Manning Marable and took credit as his lead researcher, um, told me off the record when I had invited him to debate me on my radio show and he said he would not do it. Anybody recognize any hip hop heads in here? Anybody recognize this? Who's this? Anybody know? Time's up. <laughs> it's OC, classic OC. My time, I, I have a five minute window here. But, so I, 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 you said 45, I stopped at 40. So, but, Anyway, that's, you know. Zahir Ali says, I said to him, you know, I, and when I do these, when I try to do these debates, I'm, I'm not trying to bum rush anybody. I want an actual debate. So I said, I will write out my questions, give you, send them to you, give you weeks for you and your team to, re, to develop a response, and you all can come on the show. And he said no. And then what he told me was, he said, you know, um, this research team thing, you know, Manning really did most of the work. We didn't really have that much involved. Um, and I said, but why do you keep going around representing the book then? And he said, well, you know, I respect Manning Marable. But then he said, but primarily I'm doing it to, quote, build my own brand. That's a direct quote. Um, so on the one hand, and I say that to say, on the one hand, you will help promote a book that woefully distorts, not just Malcolm as an individual, but the ideas, which for me are the most important part. I want an honest discussion of the ideas because that's what I think we need in our time. I don't think that there's any, anything happening in the world materially that, that tells us we don't need to have a, at least a discussion of socialism and communism or a discussion of armed struggle or a discussion of a new way to approach electoral politics. I don't think there's anything going on that suggests that any of that is, is irrelevant, yet these books are meant, meant to argue and suppress those, con those critiques, um, suggesting that they are irrelevant. And they're done style, with style and nuance, um, and then promoted with, with an efficiency that is, is impressive, if not so annoying and, and irritating. And then finally, I just wanted to say a word about the, even the way branding and I, I don't think obviously this was intentional, but others have pointed this out, uh, that Black Lives Matter has become BLM instead of the Black Liberation Movement. And I think that there is, again, not an intent in, um, among those engaged in that, but I think that there's something symbolically happening that is walking us away from that radicalism as much of what I'm seeing happen on the surface of Black Lives Matter, at least in the United States, is being co-opted by a nonprofit sort of industrial complex, which is what, again, Nixon wanted in response to the Black Power Movement. And that's why, as I was saying yesterday, so many problems still exist in the activist community because so many of these groups are actually, you know, uh, uh, astroturf organizations working for nonprofit and nonprofit money. And I'll, and I'll, I'll I should stop here. I had uh, got, I, I got much more to say, but I, <laughs> I was invited to a room a couple years ago by a friend of mine who works with these nonprofits in the, in the racial wealth divide. And he said, he, he literally told me, you can come, but you cannot talk. <laughs> and I went and I sat in a room, a very fancy room in Washington, DC. And I watched representatives of nonprofits who were themselves representing every oppressed community you could think of. Every single, new, every niche was represented. And everybody had a report that basically concluded all of our communities are just getting worse. Financially, materially, economically, unemployment, violence, everything is just getting worse. And went all the way around the room and it ended with Jared Bernstein, who was then uh, Biden's um, economic, uh, Vice President Biden's economic advisor. And he sat there and he smiled, very nice suit. And he literally looked at everybody in the room and he said, I really appreciate what you all are saying, but there is nothing in our policy programs that's going to address anything that you all have said. And he stood up, smiled, and walked out of the room. And when my friend asked me what I thought of the event afterwards, I said, that's why you didn't want me to speak. Because I was in my chair like, oh, are we really going to let that, you know, like, 
what my point was, you know, do we really not see what the situation is? We're all like all these groups, well paid nonprofits producing substantive work, all of which was meant to result in nothing. Because all, all of it was designed to go back to a pitch to the Democratic Party, which is itself, as others have pointed out, where radical movements go to die. Um, so I'll conclude by saying this. There's, one of the points I did want to make is that there is a function of celebrity that I don't think, um, oh wait, this, yeah, I'll just leave this up here. There's a function of celebrity that I think needs to be really challenged. Um, you know, so we were on the walking tour and we were told of the, um, the preacher who was used to promote a positive version of enslavement, right? What I was thinking at the time is this is the argument that I've developed, in, in part to be provocative, but I actually really do believe it, that all celebrity is developed for that particular purpose. So Snoop's entire career was developed specifically so he could be there to say Colin Kaepernick shouldn't be doing what he's doing. Kanye West's entire career was specifically manicured so that he would be there to have that meeting with Trump or to go around saying the things that he's saying. Um, Beyonce's career intentionally created, the celebrity intentionally created so that she would become the symbolic representation of black femininity, strength, and even liberation. And this is not a diss of any individual. And the same thing could be said for academics. Academics are well placed. As I said, Peniel Joseph, uh, the, the work as it was manipulated by Manning Marable at the end. Um, uh, Michael Eric Dyson, with whom I've had several heated debates, and I've lost them all, by the way. Not because I was wrong, but because he was better in those commercial media spaces than I am. That's another little thing. I, I use in my own classes even. I said, listen to this radio program so you can see how commercial media work. And you can see that someone like me can't function in that space because the argument is too different and, it, and, and you need a skill level that I don't have to make it plain and clear in those two minutes before a commercial while he's getting into his verbal whirlwind. Do you all know Dyson, by the way? Does anybody not know him? Of the people who do know him, how many have read his work? That's another, yeah, that's, I knew it. See, that's, 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 people don't read his work. They just know him because he's on TV. <laughs> and the work is trash. Anyway. Um, no, the work isn't trash in the sense that I just d disagree with. The work is popularized because it does what I'm arguing these other, the, it, it, and as I argue with Dyson, he becomes this popular black spokesperson for what the limits of black pop progressivism should be. So he stops it at we should support Hillary Clinton in the last election because she's because she's going to be better than Trump and anything left of that has to be marginalized or attacked um, and there's a function for that that's that's why they're promoted and that's why um, and it's not that they don't have talent quite the opposite it's that their talent as that quote from Saunders points out their talent is irrelevant it's their allegiance that is important and as long as your allegiance is, is, is there you will be promoted and and um, So I'll close by this. This is what I really, so 20 years or so ago when I was delivering pizza, I used to work with his brother named Vern. And Vern said to me one day, I'm never going to another movie with any of our people in it. And at the time I was like, what are you talking about? He said, I don't want to see any more black people in film. And I said, what are you talking about, man? You can't, you know, Denzel and something good is going to come out with black people in it. And he said, no, because we end up always just looking bad. We just always end up looking bad, and I don't want to see any more movies with black people. I only go to movies that have nothing to do with race, nothing to do with black people, that are all white cast. <laughs> I said, wow. I said, okay. 20 some odd years later, I largely agree now, and I want to promote now. I started arguing, and I talked to him recently, and he was laughing at me for saying this, but I said, I want to promote the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance. <laughs> because I think I'll argue that, that, that he's correct. I think we should, we should if not boycott, we should at, at least refuse acknowledgement or acceptance of any positive images of portrayal in commercial popular culture. We should reject them, specifically because they only exist to placate us and to dilute the radicalness and the anger that we have, the righteous radical anger that we have and that we need to feed on. I don't like, and we maybe talk more about this, I hate all of these films like Black Panther. I hate all these films like whoever. 
um, in part because they produce, promote uh, not just negative images of black people, and Black Panther really didn't do that, but uh, negative images of black radical politics. And if you look at the end of the Black Panther film where he turns over Wakanda to the CIA, it's, it's, it's a specific scene that I think is meant, and maybe this is my bias in my mind's eye, is meant to speak to Patrice Lumumba's speech to the UN in the 1960, can somebody tell me the year? I got the year, 61. Lumumba goes to the UN and says, we're free. We're taking over our resources. We're gonna, we're gonna have a revolution. We're gonna make everybody free. We're gonna help the rest of the continent. Colonialism is over. Beat it, scram, get out of here. And immediately they started plotting his assassination. Marvel's version of the Black Panther superhero is go to the UN and say, oh, we're going to give you everything, CIA. We're going to give you everything, UN. And what do they do? Fly a spaceship to the hood and, and, and set up a nonprofit. <laughs> and I think if you look at it, he walks in with a sash just like Lumumba. I mean, it is, it is, I think it is a specific to let people know, if you know, if you recognize this, this is for you. Suckers. <laughs> so, so when I hear that Ava DuVernay wants to make a movie about Asada, when I hear about um, uh, my man um, uh, Kugler wanted to make a movie about Fred Hampton Jr., I said no. And a couple friends of mine are actually uh, um, uh, advisors to him on this Fred Hampton film. And I told them, I think, I, I totally disagree with this. Should totally walk away from this. And it's not because Kugler is a bad person, and it's not because Ava is a bad person. It's because the institution itself will never allow us to see these people and their ideas carried appropriately. Never. Ava DuVernay's film on Selma erased Stokely Carmichael, erased James Foreman, erased Diane Nash. I mean, it was atrocious. Anyway, I'm so I don't want to see them making movies. I don't want to see Asada depicted. When I, when I, I hated the Malcolm X film. I, told, I think it's Spike's worst contribution because it totally distorts Malcolm X's politics. In fact, you don't even see Malcolm X's politics. In fact, you don't even see Malcolm X for 90 minutes in the film. <laughs> the first 90 minutes is all about the hustler, all about him kissing white women's feet, all about, I mean, it's all, it's, it's all ridiculous. And then by the time Malcolm is there, he's dead, the movie's over, they're showing Mandela holding the burning flag and all this, the flag of the X, and it's, it's ridiculous. And as they said themselves, Warner Brothers said, we want to make Malcolm X a popular symbolic symbol like Batman and The Simpsons. That's what they said at the time, The Simpsons. Because Warner Brothers owned The Simpsons, I think, and Batman, and they were producing, or promote, putting out the film. And then when we hear that Cosby and Oprah put in money for that film, now we know why. Because <laughs> they got nothing to do with Malcolm. All right, so I'll stop by saying the Vernon philosophy, the Russell Maroon Schultz quote, I think, is how we should approach media. If we're not, you know, I'm not advocating armed struggle, uh, but I am arm advocating that same level of conflict with popular media. We shouldn't be looking at for a positive portrayal of any of us in these films because it's not there for uh, anything other than to placate us. And then as I said here, the, because I think that the, what Fanon here said about dreams is, is essentially the, 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 the colonial media project. The settler's work is to make even dreams of liberty impossible for the native. The native work is to imagine all, methods possi all possible methods for destroying the settler. And that's why we can't be thinking about destroying the settler if we're looking and saying, oh, look at that, that sister, she took the wig off in Black Panther. That's, yeah, that's it. Yay, positive black woman portrayal. That's a, that's a step forward. No, we have to say the fact that they try to tease me with the positive portrayal of a black woman should make me even more hostile to that situation, to, that, to the people that produce that, to the Disney company that walked away with all that money. And then finally, as I used to always say with my radio program, thank you all for listening. And as Fred Hampton used to say, peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody, and thank you very much.
I just have a very simple question. Could you please show us again uh, the link of your page? Oh. Yes, because I, I missed it before. And oh, I have yeah. another question, with, uh, which is considering the names, because you named certain names, yeah. and I'd love to get them right when I do my research back sure. home. Um, sh should I paraphrase, or could you just what give me the list of the other names? That I'm you probably not going to remember. I don't even yeah, remember what I, I said two minutes ago. I'm sorry. Uh, you were talking about Robert and Mabel. Robert and Mabel Williams. Mabel. M-A-B-E-L, right? Yeah. Williams. Um, Kathleen talked about them last night, Ca Negroes with Guns. I mean, it's, they, and I want to, again, promote the Freedom Archives audio CD that you can get about them, where you can actually hear. Uh, I, it's brilliantly done, and um, they're just so important uh, to, the, to these discussions that, uh, And in fact, I was trying to support someone's research recently, and I was at the National Archives in D.C., and I got to hear some of the, the FBI's surveillance of the broadcast that, that Robert Williams did from Cuba, the Radio Free Dixie broadcast when he was um, uh, sort of exiled in Cuba and producing radio that would target the southern United States to advocate black radicalism in the South. And you could hear the FBI sort of, you know, trying to survey, you know, listen in and you could hear a little bit of the broadcast and you hear them talking it was pretty it's pretty interesting it's, it's, you know and nowadays we just put our podcasts out so it's even easier for them to do that now they don't have to I don't know. I don't think this is on. Is it on? Okay. <laughs> um, you spoke about your like the Vernon philosophy for entertainment, black entertainment. Yes. Um, and you did criticize. Well, you seem to have like a negative opinion on the export of hip hop to Af the continent of Af of Africa, but. Um, I guess maybe it's not, maybe I don't know how much political relevance it has nowadays, but at least um, like what, I feel like there was a, a positive impact on this, say at least like even in Senegal, that like the import of the, all the tapes from hip hop, American hip hop to Senegal actually affected, you know, their political um state with like they obviously combine it with their own culture of the griots um so i don't know like if you oh absolutely and i think a lot of what i've said today was rushed and and insufficiently explained so i appreciate that uh, you know the the um the real point i was trying to make is that that hip-hop in general has been um just like any product of any colonized group has been reshaped and as fanon argued turn to testify against that community. So where rap music, in my generation growing up in the, in the 80s, late 70s, 80s, we would get a full range of everything. And we could even go to one show and we would get radical politics, we would get misogyny, we would get you know, homophobia, we would get positive black women, I mean, all in one show. You get the whole you know, buffet. Now, yeah. it's almost been reduced to just the misogyny, yeah. just the anti-black, you know, the only violence you hear in rap lyrics is directed at other black and brown people. Uh, when Young Buck was gonna put out an album on Interscope, he had a song called Fuck the Police, and it, but it wasn't like, like a radical fuck the police, it was like, fuck the police, I'm gonna keep selling dope whether you want me to or not. And, but even with that, he was told he couldn't have that, uh, that song on the track, on the album. Um, uh, or, or, or rather, I'm sorry, that song was allowed to go on the album, uh, but, but um, oh, I used to have the comparison. But anyway, other songs were, were not allowed to go because uh, uh, um, there's a clear understanding that um, anti-black, anti-woman, anti-black woman messages are fine. Uh, violence or arguments directed at the police uh, or at white people is just not acceptable. Uh, and so what I was saying is that, that rap music in the United States has been totally turned on its head. And even though there is more, pop, uh, more radical art being created, it's harder to get to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so when I was, for instance, so I do know that in the 80s or so, the, the, the mixtapes that made their way to the continent 
had a massive impact and a positive one in many cases. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat friends with Shaheen uh, Arif Deen uh, from South Africa, prophets of the city, you know, they, they modeled themselves at, like a radical Wu-Tang in the 80s. Uh, and they said the same thing, we got tapes from the United States. But what I'm saying is over time that has, that has shifted. So the, the export of the, the music now, um, you don't need tapes on the ground anymore. Everybody gets the digital, and it's almost all the, the very manicured commercial form. Uh, and that I think is done intentionally. And when people don't understand the process of creating popular culture, I think they, they think that they dismiss what I'm arguing as, as conspiracy or, or whatever, but you have to understand, it, 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 I'm not saying you don't, but people have to understand that, that it really is three groups of wealthy white men and really even just two or three white men and really even just one, Lucian Grange, is considered the most powerful man in music because he owns Vivendi. And he can determine what artists become popular through sheer repetition and promotion and paying to get them on a radio, paying to get their video, getting their pay, you know, when, when, when you open up iTunes and the first song you see, I mean, that's paid to be put there. It's, it's all promoted. So all this is happening uh, intentionally. Um, so that it's in, in the impact it's having globally in the diaspora, I think, is what's happening locally in the United States, where radical artists, I saw Dead Prez make a comment where, where um, M1 said, I can't even reach my own community with my music. You know, uh, um, because of the, the blockages in the system. But it happens the same thing globally. So when you start, when, when the diaspora starts to connect, they're connecting around a commercial form of art instead of a radical set of politics. And then similarly, when we're talking about solidarity with other communities, it's the same thing. They're saying, they're like, well, all these black people are talking about is diamonds and thuggery. I mean, what the hell, are we, what, what movement are we gonna have? And then of course, it just, it, it, you know, supports the already pre-existing anti-blackness that we're all taught anyway. Um, so that's what I, and I'm just trying to argue that it's an intentional process, yeah. that's yeah. it. Yeah. I have a second question as well. Um, it's to do with your stance on social media mm -hmm. and the internet. And you're very clear on um, your position on online activism, but what do you have to say on like the role of hacktivism and leaking of documents? Because like, say I came across, um, I don't know whether it was leaked from an internal source or out, um, or like an external one, but the FBI document from <coughs> August last year, uh, black, black identity extremist. Black identity extremist, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, we, have, we have a great interview on our we website. Do, yeah, we're, what we're, can we do in this yeah. in this sense of uh, online activism, more in terms of you know technology programming, getting black people into programming, and actually taking the information out because it's obviously like this is a case of the miseducation of the masses. So this, this I, I just want to echo what, what I heard Feroz say earlier, and I think I heard Kathleen and Emery say the other day as well, that, that organization is the key. Nothing without political organization is going to be effective. So hacking individually or in small collectives is great. We can all benefit from it in some ways. That The release of that document was fascinating, um, especially given how ignorant it is. It's not even like well done. I mean, you could read other FBI documents that are at least well done. I mean, he's like, you did your research. This is poor. Uh, and we have a great discussion on our website with Daruba bin Wahad about that, black, that I invite you all to watch. Uh, um, but uh, so organization is the key. I have actually advocated, it did not work, but I have actually advocated with some friends of mine that we all collapse our websites into one and start doing that as a model. Because when you look at the website, when you look at how the internet is used, I mean, uh, I used to look at this work by Matthew Hindman, who, who would get the data about what websites in the world are really most popular. And he would use these circles to demonstrate. And he would say, you know, all the news websites in the world get this many hits. And he drew a circle like this. Then he said, all the email in the world takes up about this much of the internet. And then he said, but what the internet is really used for is porn. And he drew this circle, he's like, the whole board was porn. So, uh, and then similarly, when you look at the most popular news websites, they're all connected to the traditional commercial interests that previously dominated the news industries. When you look at, uh, um, uh, example, I was talking about Kanye West, and I was saying, let's stop focusing on Kanye and look at the people that popularize him. Because the reason he's popular is so that, that he occupies this space that maybe an, an Emory Douglas might have occupied at one point. Uh, and specifically, Lior Cohen. And for those of my generation, Lior or Liar, who you like to call him, Lior Cohen, 
who has promoted, who has almost single-handedly destroyed popular rap music, is now the head of YouTube music, which is the most popular disseminator of music in the world. So the same old industry head is now heading the new one. And he's even had more power to promote and popularize art around the world than he had in the old formation. So what I was advocating was, you know, it's kind of like in the United States when we saw the rise of the Huffington Post before it became what it became. I was somewhat intrigued by the, the model that you have a bunch of somewhat, at the time, nominally progressive I don't, I don't, journalists all producing content for this website that would promote the website itself and promote the work within all the individuals in the website as opposed to I have a website, you have a website, she has a website, he has a website, and then we say, you link to me, I link to you. It, 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 it doesn't work that way. And when you look at the, the and when you look at Alexa.com, if you want to look at the, the world rankings for, for websites, I mean, I love my website. We've worked a lot on that website. We don't even make the top 20 million in the world. I mean, it's like, it's like you have to, there's so much being produced that I think the internet is in our small isolated silos gets, more credit for doing good than it really does. And because I may be more easily able to reach you, I think that's a positive for all of us collectively and it doesn't really work that way. And as I said before, all the most militant and largest movements existed pr prior to the internet. I think the internet does more to mollify us, isolate us, and feed us our individual tastes and wants whenever we want and then, uh, uh, and as I was saying, personalize our oppression. And as the research as I was referring to, Sophia Emoja Noble, her new book, uh, Algorithms of Oppression, uh, and Morgan Maxwell, who uh, doesn't have, I think, a book yet, but her PhD research, and we've interviewed her all this, you can find on our website. She, she does this great research that shows black women in particular, but black people in general, the more you engage with popular media and social media, the more you experience racism, the more you experience negativity, the more you end up literally physically deteriorating as a result, while enriching financially and otherwise all these entities that we don't, shouldn't want any interaction with. So, I mean, I use it, I'm on Twitter, I'm telling you, I'm saying please go to my website, but I, I have no illusions the fantasy I have is goes back to Robert, uh, I'm sorry, the fantasy I have is go back to Robert Williams, that maybe the two people we reach will be, one of them will be Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, so I, I, to really, to, I've learned a lot today, and I've learned a lot about what you've said, and I think that to a very large extent, I completely understand what you're saying about uh, what celebrity does and, and how that has been constructed, especially with the way that media works as well. But if you look, I mean, if I look around myself, and around, especially when I look at younger people, people that don't necessarily, um, I think in Holland especially, don't really know how to accumulate information. So they kind of stare at screens quite a lot. Mm -hmm. When they saw, for example, a Solange and a Don't Touch My Hair, that touched a nerve, even though that was allowed to come through the, mm -hmm. whatever we might call it, but the fact that she exists, and the fact that she's Beyonce's sister, and the fact that Beyonce went and did a full tour with all black women on her tour that mm -hmm. refuses kind of to work with a majority of white people because she doesn't have to, mm -hmm. all of this does resonate a certain type of uh, self-worth with a lot of people that didn't know that, that was there. For me, when I hear you talk about um, TV in the 90s, I didn't know doctors around me uh, like some of the people here did. I watched The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air to think that that was possible. Um, uh, I know that it might seem uh, to a lot of people, and especially if you think about it on a higher level, that these things seem um, produced and uh, they give me a certain idea of what I'm allowed to appeal to, yes. But in the same right, I think that a lot of the things, especially nowadays with how a lot of us do know how to hack or break or think or look at the internet, um, that we're learning to use it in a different way. I was wondering what your opinion was on that and about how that... I, I mean, again, I think, look, this is the same... It, it, without the political education and organization, it all loses, I think, ultimate effectiveness. It's, it, it is not that we lack intelligence or enthusiasm. We lack organization. What I don't like about the Beyonce tour 
is that again, it is a $50 million Pepsi sponsored event. The fact that you, that, and, and the fact that they could do that and still produce on some level a positive impact on oppressed people makes me angry. Not because I don't want people to have a positive image to aspire to, but because I don't want it to come from people who know they, they never intend for it to happen and are only doing it to, to make sure we don't rebel to the point that we actually have a revolution that would make all of this moot in the first place. That's what I'm trying to say. So I'm not, and I get it. You know, I've had friends of mine who are, who are asked by the State Department to go on tour. And they're radical artists. And they're like, see? And I'm saying, but don't you get, now again, I'm not invited, so I don't know what it feels like. Nobody says, Jared, would you go on tour and share your thoughts with the world? So I, I understand, nobody's written me a check with a whole bunch of zeros on it and made me really struggle with my principles. I don't, so I'm, I get it, I'm not, I'm, not per, I'm not better than anybody. I'm just trying to make an analysis here. But I say to them, just trying lovingly, like, but don't you see, all of us want on some level to be wanted. But we all have to be, on some level, also honest about why, are, like even with this, I ask myself, why did they invite me? Not that I have low self-worth, but I want to know, what is, it, what is it they're really trying to do? What do they want me here for? So it's the same thing. What does the State Department really want me to do? Do they really want to spread radical politics? Or are they doing what they did with jazz in the 50s and send black people around the world to make the world think that black people are doing better than they are? I mean, at the same point, they invited Eartha, Eartha Kitt to the dinner and they exiled her. So we still get to, I'm sorry, we still get to go places and do things with our power we're given. And look what they did with the Fresh Prince. I know. They put that on there and then they took the dark-skinned mother off and replaced her with the light-skinned woman. Exactly. Yes, yeah. Yes. And then they want, <laughs> they want young black people to think, especially overseas, man, America has something for us. Maybe we should listen to them a little bit more. And I'm saying, no. I'm, I'm, so I'll stop here. There was a professor I had that, I, that I, we disagreed on everything when I was an undergrad, except one thing. He used to say, interrogate your preferences. And I just simplified it in my classrooms to say, you have to always ask yourself, why do I like what I like, and how do I know what I know? Um, not necessarily to change it, but how did I reach this conclusion? Because, especially in this context where, again, materially, black people in the United States are worse off than ever. It looks better, but materially, the same one-tenth of one percent of the nation's wealth, long-term unemployment rates longer than the 1940s, mass incarceration going through the roof, police violence, this shift, this slick shift that the 13th documentary ran, that hustle that Ava played on us, talking about an advance on, po on policing when they're, all they're doing is moving us from prisons to locking us up in our homes with new devices owned by the Koch brothers. I mean, this, 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 like, this, there's such a hustle being run on us that, 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 that that's what I'm saying. If I like a song that comes out, I'm like, man, I got to be careful with that. Why? I love French fries, but they're not good for me. Twice in the 1980s, I smoked crack. There's nothing better than that, man. I would never. Nothing better on the planet than smoking crack. It's better than sex, especially that first time. Better than sex, better than love, better than anything. Thank you, I will not be trying crack. But my point is, but my point is, it's horrible for you. And a sustained relationship with it will destroy you. And that's my point about media. That's, all, that's the same exact point I'm trying to say about media. You, when that thing comes on, you're like, man, I like that show. Why? And then, and then I gotta be careful. I had, I'm sorry, I, I had I, one I, second I, I, question. If oh, uh, uh, yeah, yes. okay, but uh, we got to keep it short because like yeah. other people who don't get a chance to ask questions okay. that we're no, off. then I will not have a second. I'm question sorry, I, I, that, and that's my fault. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Ball has galvanized the, uh, the people here. Luckily enough, uh, you're staying overnight uh, yeah. tonight, so uh, we're. <laughs> and can <laughs> we? Be here I appreciate, but but Jared is fine. Okay, Jared's uh, staying here. Brother Jared, Jared, Brother Jared. JB, <laughs> my man. <laughs> Uh, Jared's staying here uh, for dinner, <laughs> and uh, um, it's going to be. Uh, we're also going to have another uh, discussion after Rose's talk, where uh, some people who had their hands up can ask, can also ask questions. Is there something that really cannot wait? Cannot wait. I see him. <laughs> it's Space very accurate for 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 yeah, this discussion. So. Go ahead. Can I, yeah, okay, so I'm, I myself, I'm a musician, I'm an artist, I'm, I'm producing stuff, I'm a poet. Mm. I call myself an insp inspirator. Anyways, long story short, what would you advise us as creators? 
how we can build through these systems that are set out trying to, to spread messages of knowledge that actually contain knowledge and empowerment. How can we build through these iTunes walls of companies that are putting down these boundaries if we ourselves are these small little aiming for this Ho Chi Minh, hopefully, people, well, you know? I mean, I guess I would, I would go back to what I was trying to say, at least how I interpreted Emory Douglas's point in that interview I read some years ago, that, that absent any organized effort, join other artists, create collectives, produce your own work, find ways to distribute your own work, keep ownership of your copyright, keep ownership of your royalties, and be willing to sacrifice one of the three that everybody wants. And my argument is you can never be rich, famous, and radical all at the same time. <laughs> and I think history, without exception, makes this point very clear. There is not, I'm not aware of anyone who sustained all three. You can get one, maybe two, but once you hit the third, something happens to you. Bob Marley, Tupac, Paul Robeson, Hazel Scott, Canada Lee. I mean, the history, the list is long. Once you start blending your fame and your radicalism, your fame and your wealth with some radical pods, <laughs> Jay-Z told Kanye, don't keep talking about George Bush. After that Katrina thing, George Bush don't like black people. I don't know if you remember that. Jay-Z was like, cut, you better cut that. And then we haven't heard from him since. Now he's hanging with Trump. So my point is, like, develop collectives, Politically educate, organize with one another, uh, and honestly, that's the only way the answer is going to come. I don't really, honestly, I don't know. I mean, but keep producing the work, keep doing the work, though. Keep, keep the art needs to keep coming. Okay, everybody, please give it up again for <laughs> Jared Paul. Thank you very much. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.